Hey, how you doing, everybody? And welcome to this week's Photo Friday. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen. I'm Bob. And again, welcome to this week. Yeah, how you doing? And uh, what's well, been a crazy week here, guys. Um, a lot of really weird stuff happening with COVID. Uh, this is our last week before we head back to Ontario. It All is. kinds of weird things going on at the Ontario-Manitoba border. So mm -hmm. it's been a little chaotic. But you know what? We are still able to get out and do some photography and enjoy ourselves, which is really the name of the game. It's been a great winter. And uh, this yeah. week we're featuring uh, our visit to Beacon Hill Park in uh, just in Victoria. Yes. So Beacon Hill Park is a 200-acre park that's located along the shore of the Juan de Fuca Strait in Victoria, B.C. It was formalized in 1882 when the province of British Columbia granted 75 hectares to the city of Victoria to be held in trust. Beacon Hill Park defines the very essence of Victoria and was designated a municipal heritage site in 2009. There was uh, meandering footpaths along strong uh, strolls, uh, along manicured and natural areas featured for the whole family to enjoy, uh, beautiful landscaping. Um, kite enthusiasts, paragliders, and sailboaters can also take advantage of the open vista across the Strait of the Juan de Fuca. That's great. It is. And one thing that I found really interesting was it's actually designated as Mile Zero. And what that means is it has an important status as Mile, mile Zero, the western terminus of the 8,000 kilometer Trans-Canada Highway. So when we're heading back, we're going to start right at zero and drive to Ontario. That's right, too. <laughs> so uh, this mile zero post that you see is at uh, the southwest corner of the park, along with the old Beacon Lodge and the famous Beacon Drive-In. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so as you can see here, beautiful, beautiful flower flowers. beds. Um the yeah. amount of flowers and, and how they are uh, landscaped and, yeah. and well taken care of. It, yeah, is... it actually reminds me of Edwards Gardens. Actually, that's very true. Yeah. But it, even on a larger scale, a I much find... Much larger scale than Edwards Gardens, yeah. Yeah, because there's, there's so many different types of flowers. Um, we went for walks and you just, you couldn't, you couldn't walk more than five feet and stop and want to get a picture of the beautiful flowers. Yeah. I mean, it's such a great place to go with your camera because you can experiment and do different types of photography and stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's a really beautiful place to walk around. And this one, you actually uh, turned it into a black and white. And that's what, that was uh, what the cherry blossom tree. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which Victoria is well known for. They have the, the light pink ones and the dark pink ones, and they basically start to bloom in March right through to April. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. And of course, everyone tulips. knows the beautiful tulips. And this, this I call it a feather, but it was so pretty. Yeah, it was actually just kind of like, it was nicely lit when we were going back to the Jeep. And it actually caught both of our eyes. And we just said, okay, we got to get a couple of shots of this. But it's very soft. It was, and the sun was just shining on it just perfectly. And it really, it was beautiful. And this is one of the many uh, bridges over the water features. There were mm -hmm. so many uh, waterfalls. Water oh my gosh, it's just amazing. As you're walking through the park, there's so many small little tributaries mm -hmm. and stuff that's there. There's ducks going up and down the tributaries, which is great. Oh, they're all um, over. They're all over the place. And yeah. there's ponds. There's just one of them, and that's only a portion of it. It was mm -hmm. quite big. Um, but the colors of the, the trees that you get, the reflection in the water as well. Um, and, uh, there's one of the water features, um, and you can see the, the mallard duck at the top there. Yep. And there's also, uh, wooden paths or, um, uh, wooden trails, very heavily treed. Here you'll see this beautiful carved, uh, chair, um, that was done. And, uh, along with that, there was this couch that was on one of the paths, um, just stunning. There's also a petting zoo. There's playing fields, tennis courts. It's it's a really large park, and it has it various different uh, amenities there. And you see a lot of people, local and tourists, enjoying it. People will go there and have picnics. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, oh, and this tree. Yeah, my old man tree. When I'm done with this, um, it's going to look like it came out of a Tim Burton movie. It's going to be bizarre. This is what? really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it it's, it's reminds really me of cool. Cousin It. Yeah, yeah, really. It yeah. does. Yeah. Now, Sir James Douglas, the land was originally set aside as a protected area by Sir James Douglas, who was the governor of the colony of Vancouver Island in 1858. In 1882, the land was officially named a municipal park of the city of Victoria and was given its present name. The name is derived from a small hill overlooking the strait upon which stood navigational beacons. The hill is culturally significant, having been a burial site for the First, First Nations Coast Salish people, who are the original inhabitants of the Greater Victoria region. Um, this hill also provides scenic vistas and views of the Strait and of the Olympic uh, Mountains of Washington. Wow, that's incredible. It is. Yes, now this is actually, we had the, the mile marker that was actually for um, traveling. This is actually a marker for the Lekwagen uh, Nation. And this particular marker is uh, was put up um, in respect of the tribe, um, First Nation tribe. But going back to uh, what we were talking about with the park itself, um, the park is definitely one of the jewels um, of the city of Victoria. Its long history dates back to when the Saugies Nation um, the land back then belonged to the Lekwagen people. Uh, first occupied the area, then that area was known as Mikan, um, which means warmed by the sun. Oh, neat. Evidence of the occupation of the Lekwagen people was found in various shells and middens in the area. Now, a midden is uh, also known as a kitchen midden or a shell heap, is an old dump for domestic waste, which may consist of animal bones, botanical material like plants, pottery shards, and of course, human excrement. Um, other artifacts, and of course, that are basically associated with uh, human occupation helps in understanding the area. Um, there are also several house platforms that are actually still visible at the south end of the park, and remnants of um, defense trenches at Holland Point and additional house platforms that have been found at the north end of the park um, and the remnants of these uh, fortified village sites are dated back to 950 AD. Um, they were found at Finlinson Point. Wow. Now what's really unique is in April Beacon Hill is covered by Blue Blossoms um, Camas flower. This particular flower is cultivated as a food source for the First Nations people of the area. Uh, Beacon Hill was also a burial site evidenced by uh, burial, car burial cairns on Beacon Hill. And basically a cairn is a stack of rocks that has either meaning or purpose. And um, the cairns, they serve as landmarks. Mm. Um, they serve as burial mounds. And some experts um, have stated that these ancient stone stacks were also used for astrological, ceremonial, and hunting purposes. Wow. Now, unfortunately, back in the 70s, some of the Cairns got demolished because of grass mowing. But luckily enough, in 1986, the staff at the Royal BC Museum aided in the reconstruction and um, basically rebuilt a lot of these burial Cairns, which is great. Oh, neat. Now, more information can be found um, about this on the victoriaheritagefoundation.ca website. And of course, we're gonna place a link for that um, down underneath. So you can kind of do any more research or find out any more information if you want. That's really interesting. It's pretty cool. It yeah. is. And now you can see on this map, the size of the park and the close proximity actually to uh, Victoria. Yeah, most definitely. And uh, you know, you can see um, Finlayson Point. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the where the Karens are. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really just a spectacular park to walk. Around. And for us to go there, we actually just walked right down Douglas Street. So it was basically a ten minute walk to get From there. From where we are staying, yes. That's yeah. right. Yeah, it's really a great place. It's beautiful. It is very nice. Now, although much of the park has been uh, landscaped into gardens and playing fields, such as the tennis courts and and uh, playing fields. It's populated with various structures. A great deal of the native flora has been reserved, uh, preserved. 
um, such as the Gary Oak trees, the Arbutus, Douglas fir, the Western Red Cedar, Camas, which you talked about, Trillium, Snowberry, Oregon Grape, and Fawn Lily still remain in the park. So they're preserving that, the original florals that were there. Yeah, that's amazing. It is. Yeah. A number of environmentally sensitive areas have also been identified in the park and are protected through the local, provincial, and federal law to preserve these threatened and endangered species in the ecosystem. Uh, most notable and prominent one is the Gary Oak. Um, is featured in Beacon Hill Park. It's among Canada's most rare and endangered tree. Wow, I didn't know that. I didn't either. Mm. Now, in the fall, the Gary Oak trees will shed their leathery leaves, uh, revealing gnarled branches that are covered with lichens, liverworts, and mosses. Yeah, that's what I fell in love with. When we first arrived, mm -hmm. they were just an amazing looking tree. They I've are. I've never seen anything like that, the way they were so, the branches were so gnarly. Well, you can see in the bottom right picture there, that's uh, the, the base of one of them that I tried to photograph and be able to get that yes. uh, distinctiveness of it. Yep. Um, but in addition to the Gary Oak uh, ecosystem, another threatened species is the yellow montane violet, yes. which is the flower you see there in the center. And I remember seeing these at the park, didn't realize that it was an endangered uh, no. species, but they are amazingly beautiful. They are pretty, they are. and there's just, there's so much to learn very, about. Very, very brilliant yellow. Very pretty, very pretty. Now, along with all of the, um, the trees and flowers, there's a lot of wildlife in the park. Oh yes, um, he loves her wildlife. I was in my glory. <laughs> so this, <laughs> there's squirrels, and this squirrel actually, uh, we were actually taking photographs, and Bob was, you were standing there, and he was looking, looking up at, at you yeah. as if, are you going to feed me? Yeah. <laughs> um, because the wildlife there is so used to um, humans, humans walking around, they don't feel threatened. Yeah. Uh, you'll just walk down the pass and they'll be right beside you. Mm -hmm. um, Which really gives you an opportunity to get some really unique pictures. Oh, it does. I mean, this, the mallard was literally right in front of me here looking at me as if, have you got food for me? And, yeah. and of course I did, and I did feed her. <laughs> um, but uh, Canada geese, which we're all familiar with, uh, lots of those. Um, more mallard ducks sleeping in amongst all of the beautiful gardens. Yeah. Um, one particular, this was this, really neat. It was really neat. Uh, the turtles on this log, we actually counted them and there were 20 turtles out sunbathing on the log. Now I have to tell you the story about this though. Karen and I were actually driving down Douglas and Karen had looked over to the pond mm -hmm. and she goes, oh my God, all the turtles are out, all the turtles are out. So we decided we pull over and that basically started our day. <laughs> it did, it did. It's, it's, it's a great place to walk around. Um, here are the manicured gardens, just the archway there covered with the leaves. Absolutely As you beautiful. can see, you walk on the pass, the ducks aren't, they just walk right in front of you. They're mm -hmm. not afraid of you, they're not intimidated. Uh, by you at all. Yeah. Um, it now, is really nice. the other thing that I definitely found really interesting, both of us did, is when we were walking on one of the paths and we didn't know it until we read the sign and this it the says, first time that we went. that's right, there was a sign that said that it was the blue heron nesting area. It was, it it was noted says for it. Quiet. Yeah. Blue herons are nesting. That's right. So we actually stood there and looked up at the trees, and I mean way up at the trees, and lo and behold, they were up, you could hear them, and then they, you could see them actually sometimes before you could hear them, because yeah. their movement. Their movement was just, it was loud, mm -hmm. it was. But I'm gonna be honest here. I don't know about you, Karen, but seriously, man, I didn't know that blue herons made nests in trees. I honestly thought that they built their nests in a marsh area. I assume that as well. I had no idea. Because they're a, they're a, a water bird, like you're all, you see them in marshy areas. Exactly, that's what I thought. For the fish and the snakes, yeah, right? I was shocked when I found out about this. So was I, and that's why it kind of, I wouldn't have even, if I had not have seen that sign, I would not have thought to look up in the trees for here, them. People are probably going, you guys are nuts. <laughs> now one of the other animals that uh, was walking around was oh, peacocks. Yeah. 
you're walking it, and they're just walking down the path. And, and they, what do they like to eat, Karen? Well, these peacocks like peanuts. Oh, yeah. So I found that out, and on our second visit, I made sure I had some peanuts. Of and yes, I fed the peacocks. <laughs> Uh, same thing. I was just amazed that they're just—they're not intimidated, intimidated by us at all. And you couldn't even feel when he was taking the peanuts. No, he was so—he was so gentle. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Now this next picture, talk about being at the right place at, at the, the right, right time. time. Yeah. Uh, we had just arrived at the park, walked in. We were heading uh, towards a certain section that we're going to go through in a minute. And just off to the right, there was, a, there was one lady there taking a picture with her phone, and there was a peregrine falcon. I have never seen a falcon that close. Never. This is zoomed in, I was, but we were probably only about, I'd say about 25 20 feet. feet away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, this falcon had caught the squirrel, squirrel. Yeah. and was actually attempting to take the squirrel away for its dinner, did try to pick it up and it but, was actually too heavy it couldn't leave with the squirrel yeah it was a young peregrine falcon it just didn't have the wing capacity to get this puppy up off the ground yeah but uh yeah definitely right really place cool. at the right time yeah like i mean it's just beautiful beautiful bird oh it is most definitely now another one of the items that the park is notable for is this totem pole this totem pole, when it was crafted and put, uh, when it was crafted and erected, it was the largest totem pole in the world back in 1956, right. reaching 127 feet. Now it's basically the fourth tallest totem pole in the world. It's still not bad. No, it's it's beautiful, but it the is. colors yeah. and the detail. Yeah. It's um, a Oh, it is. It's yeah. it's really tall. Now, the other thing um, is this stone bridge. It's also referred to as the pebble bridge over the stream, and it's between the Good Acre and the Fountain Lake, and it is a tribute to renowned BC artist Emily Carr. It was erected by her sister, Alice Carr, in 1945. Yeah, that is just amazing. I mean, Emily Carr, Group of Seven, that whole mm -hmm. thing, I, I love all of their artwork. So, I mean, being able to walk over that bridge and know that it was, you know, donated by her sister for uh, Emily, that's just, it's just neat. And it's so pretty. It is. It really is yeah. pretty. Um, now, the other uh, thing that we found out about this is what they call the Moss Lady. This is so cool. The Moss Lady, she is 11 meters long and 1.7 meters high, and she's actually located behind the band shell on the west side of the park near Douglas Street. Mm -hmm. The city staff brought the, no the Moss Lady to life in 2015 using a stainless steel frame, cement, boulders, metal pipe, vinyl coated chicken wire, and a clay-based soil suitable for moss. That's so neat. It is. The cattail and the club moss were harvested from Vancouver Island, and the hair is made of flowering crocosimia plants. Oh, right, crocosimia. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So the moss lady was actually inspired by the mud maiden, which is found in the lost gardens of Heligan in England. Of course. <laughs> and she actually has um, a cousin, Lily, who resides in the Waterfall Cottage Gardens in Australia. Cool. That's going to have to be on our bucket list, honey. We have to go see our cousin. That would be pretty nice. That would be. That would be very nice. Yeah. So that basically summarized our day. We really had a good time at, uh, at Beacon Hill Park. Yeah, there's still so many things that we haven't even seen yet. Oh, there that is. we've got to get back to again. Yeah, we did so, not walk the entire, the entire park. park. No, no. <laughs> no. It's, uh, it's, it's really very pretty. It is. It is. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, you know, we actually uh, put together a booklet that's mm -hmm. for beginning photographers. Someone right. who's just getting into it. And mm -hmm. um, getting started with photography, we have a free uh, PDF that's available um, on our website. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually decided, uh, you know, we'd kind of talk about it a little bit more. So mm -hmm. last week we talked about aperture control and how using your aperture can help create mm -hmm. some interesting photos. Um, basically, 
utilizing a smaller depth of field. Mm -hmm. um, smaller depth of field, smaller opening, smaller smaller number. Yeah. And then, of course, having a larger depth of field, you're going to want to use a larger number. Um, so you get more oh. depth. Of field. And you can see the difference in this picture because now you actually see the umbrellas in focus. Exactly. Whereas on the other one, um, it was a shallower depth of field. Exactly. Huh. Yeah. Very interesting. Gives so, you a, a completely different perspective. It does. And it really helps change the mood. Like if you were to just flip back to that other one for a second, you can see yeah. that the focus is more on the plants. It is. And the color in the background is just, it's just soft. It's mm -hmm. there. So, you, you know, it's there, but it's not the focal point. No. But, um, well, moving forward, I mean, what we really want to talk about today is um, our shutter speed and how mm -hmm. we can actually use our shutter speed to help transform um, our photography and, and kind of add a little bit more visually to um, our photography. So mm -hmm. here we have um, an image that I shot. It was at uh, 20th of a second, um, F22. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I believe it was probably around one o'clock in the afternoon when we started shooting this. Mm -hmm. So um, if we go to the next one, basically this is 20 seconds mm -hmm. and you can see the difference how the fountain itself just, it changes. It has a mood of its own. Oh, it changes the whole feel of the picture. Yeah, it's very kind of, soft. It's very soft. You get that silky, um, mm -hmm. smooth feeling to the water um, mm -hmm. and to the fountain itself. But basically the reason why you can do all this is this guy right here. Um, it's a nine stop mm -hmm. um, ND filter that right. we use. So we place this on the front of our, um, on the front of the lens. And this is basically what we use that allows us to stop down nine stops to be able to open up um, our time. And we can expand our time because we've been able to step it down. Now, we started F22. You can shoot at F18, but mm -hmm. um, this particular day, I liked actually shooting at F22. I was mm -hmm. able to take advantage of um, a narrower aperture and um, increase the amount of time that I had the shutter open to help create those nice milky white uh, for exactly. instance, here. Yes. Now, there's a couple of things that actually have that happened here. Mm -hmm. The first time that we went there, um, I noticed that the actual sun, when it was moving around, um, it shone a light on the two outside. Um, on the right-hand side. Yeah, you, can, you can see it. So when we went there this time, I wanted to make sure that we got there at the right time so that we could actually take it, well, so I could take advantage of getting the shot mm -hmm. with the light on the fountain and on the two fountain heads mm -hmm. that are shooting up the water. Mm -hmm. um, and 47 seconds is a long time, but once again, utilizing this nine stop ND filter allowed me to get that 47 seconds. And, this and one now here at 50 seconds. At 50 seconds. And you can see the difference between the two. It just smooths everything right out. It's such a soft. Well, the water looks like glass. It does. That's exactly what it looks like to me. Yeah. Yeah, and once again, it's just everything to do with the filter, mm -hmm. um, has everything to do with being able to take your uh, shutter speed and mm -hmm. slow it down. Right. right? Yep. Yep. And this one here was basically just a, uh, well, an old school black and white that I kind of wanted to do with it just for something to do. And from a different perspective, too. Yeah, that was, I actually found that location the last time that we were there. Mm -hmm. I got into um, the little creek area and there was a little bit of an overhang. I cut that off, actually, because it was kind of, a visual thing but right um, it was uh, just a different angle yeah, yeah 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 now here we have just a regular shot done at 200 um, and then of course I'm sitting at f13 here um, <coughs> and me. now we're going to actually now I'm shooting at f18 but this time it's only eight seconds long so <coughs> excuse me the, the reason why basically um, I had to change things up there was a little bit more sunlight that was actually hitting the top <coughs> of the uh, the water. So basically I couldn't allow, allow that exposure to run um, any longer than eight seconds. If I went 10 seconds or 12 seconds, it would actually blow out. So even though I still had the ND on there, I still had to watch the amount of um, time that I had the shutter open. But once again, I was able to take advantage of a longer shutter um, and get that silky white. <coughs> so Excuse as you me. can see here, we actually did this one. Um, this it was is, it was very bright. <coughs> Excuse me. It was yeah. very bright that day. It was very bright that day. <coughs> really bright. And um, we were able to basically, I think this one was shot at, uh, this one was also shot at F18. <coughs> and we had this one on for 10 seconds because I was further back. That's right. Yeah. 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 But that's really what it's all about. I mean, it is. It's it's 
It's about playing with the different settings to give you that different mood and that different shot. Yep, most definitely. And we've got all that information available for <clears throat> anyone who's a beginner. Um, it's available on our website. We're going to mm -hmm. have a link uh, basically in the comment section just down below. And um, we talk about shutter speed. Um, mm -hmm. We talk about understanding um, your the sensor pixels. and That's the pixels. Right. Um, and really, it's, uh, it's a great booklet. It is. We also talk about composition, mm -hmm. uh, which is really important because that gives you a different perspective in the image as well, such as your uh, rule of thirds, yep. um, leading lines. Yep. You can see in the photographs here uh, where, you know, we ended up getting down low, taking uh, photographs of the railway, the leading lines with the floral gardens. Yep. Um, there's a lot of different options that you have and a lot to learn. And like Bob had said, is we wanted to be able to put this booklet together for everyone out there and share it and pay it forward because we did have help Most when we first started, started out. Yep. Um, and we wanted to share that knowledge and be able to have, uh, you know, allow people to download it for free and, and use that. And use the information. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's really what it's all about. Like I said, that link will be available um, right on the uh, YouTube channel here, yep. just down below. Yeah. <laughs> now we'd like to share a video with you of our, our day at uh, Beacon Hill Park, and here we go. We hope you enjoy it. Yep.
so cute that was uh, the um, the video where the 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 goats were um, was by the petting zoo and unfortunately with COVID it's actually closed and just wanted to let you know because I didn't realize it the other screeching sound that you would actually hear where the goats were that was the uh, the peacocks talking yes yeah. and uh, that was really interesting but anyways yeah we hope you like the video and we certainly enjoyed our day uh, at Beacon Hill. Mm -hmm. It was great. Most it really definitely. Was. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was. So um, I guess this is um, this, this is, is our last one from Victoria. Yeah, it is yeah. because we actually leave here uh, next Friday. Yep. So a week today, um, we'll be on the ferry. Yeah. So we're hoping that we'll be able to do from our maybe our first stop location or or maybe even from the ferry if if the Wi-Fi is is good we might be able to do um, an FB live that would be nice yeah. we could maybe do some sort of a Facebook update or but uh, stay we'll tuned on that. our through our lens Facebook page and we'll uh, we'll yeah, keep we'll you posted post everything up there yeah. yeah most definitely so guys um, I just basically want to say thank you and um, it was really a lot of fun being here in Victoria, um, especially all of the photographers that we met while we were here. Uh, uh, Brian, Tony, uh, Jeff. Um, Jeannie. Jeannie, yeah. Um, I think it was Mary, Mary Ann. Yeah. Um, there was a super lot, nice of, a lot people. of really great photographers and super nice people that we met. So guys, mm -hmm. we'll see you next year. Oh, well, actually, it won't be next year, will it? Yeah, we're at, well, we're next winter. Next winter. We're coming back. Hopefully uh, next winter. We're planning to come back in November for yes. the winter. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but uh, thanks again, and... Um, Wish you guys all the best, and we'll see you soon from, you know, wherever. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> all right. Take Bye care. for now. Bye-bye.